Hey guys, this is Kirov speaking and today we are going to take a look at various graphs in the game. Nothing new, but I wanted to explain them while there still are no proper tutorial videos on the issue. So today we are going to focus on the braking graphs and the suspension graph and how to properly set up your car. And here we are getting right into the braking side of things. And this is a properly set up car for 2015. Even though the stats wouldn't indicate that, uh, neither drivability nor sportiness are particularly good. And that is only because of the braking tab settings. So, in order to correct these things, we do need to understand the right hand graph. In here, the front wheels are red and the rear wheels are blue while the less colored lines are denoting the brake performance for the respective wheels, while the more vividly colored lines are denoting the wheel grip on the road. So the first step is to see that in this case we have a severe lack of brake performance compared to the wheel performance. Even though this is a car which has an almost 50-50 weight distribution, you can see that the red line for the front tire grip is much higher than the rear curve. And this is because of the weight distribution during deceleration. When you are braking, weight is shifted to the front and putting more pressure on the front tires, which then gives them more normal force and the normal force is multiplied with the friction coefficient of the tires, which then corresponds to grip and hence we do need more powerful brakes for the front. This will be even more extreme with front heavy cars and less extreme with mid-engine cars or rear heavy cars. The first method to bring up the brake performance is of course to choose better brakes and we are going to start with the front ones. In 2015 at 1.6 tons I would recommend going for Venter discs especially for more sporty cars. And what we can see here is that the, uh, the straight, uh, lighter colored red line went up a bit. That indicates a rise in brake performance. So right now, if we make the disc size larger, which also increases brake performance, you see that the um, red line shifts up, but also the target shifts up. And that is due to that if you're braking harder, you will also at the same time incur a um, higher weight distribution towards the front which will make the front tires grip even more and requiring you more brakes. So now we are at a pretty large size already and we are still not quite there. That means that you at least have to consider going for more pistons because this in this case we can still not lock up the wheels. If we are going for free pistons, we see, aha, uh -huh, now we can lock up the wheels and there's quite a bit of margin. It may be too much margin, but that is a question for right after we've set up the rear brakes. Now that I have set up the rear brakes as well, you can see that, okay, now both front and rear can lock up the wheels and our braking performance has increased massively and thus the stats of the car massively as well. But we are not done here yet, because there is another important factor in all of this, and this is brake fade. And you will be seeing uh, negative numbers here, especially if you are using solid discs or worse. And right now, if we go to this setup, we are at minus 8.8, .8, which will affect drivability and sportiness uh, negatively. In order to get rid of the brake fade, we are going for better cooled vented discs and then play around with the size. We see that if we drop down the size in the front, brake fade doesn't change, which means that this front brake, these front brakes are not the limiting factor. Indeed, we can go down to 310 millimeters before anything gets worse. For the rear, it looks pretty much different. So we can go up a bit and see it continues to decrease until we reach 0% at 255. Currently in automation the pad type does not affect brake fade, but this will probably be added later on because it just makes sense. More aggressive pads usually are a bit more hardened towards um, fading, while more comfortable ones are more prone to it. 
So what we can do now in this state of the game without this uh, pad type affecting it is dropping the pad type as much as the curve here allows. So we can drop the front towards a 40-ish setting while we can drop the rear more significantly probably maybe a 30 setting. Yes, there we go. This makes the car more drivable but also of course right now that is only if you want to make an actually comfortable car you would be going for this because this is not only more comfortable but also more tame to drive while the other setting is more sporty so it is a compromise if you are in the situation where you want to have a very comfortable and easy to drive car but you don't want to have brake fade you would drop these both to zero and then adjust the um, size of the disc such that it goes beyond the um, grip curves for both front and rear. And you can see here that in this case you don't even really succeed with that. So you would then have to up either brake pad type or go for more pistons which further increases smoothness and quality of ride. When we are going to much earlier years, like in this case 1950, we are running into different problems and that is there are only drum brakes. And you will encounter this especially at the start of the game in the campaign mode, but uh, there is a way around these problems as well. Uh, either you just accept that your car has shitty brakes or you try to go a bit more aggressive on the pad type which increases brake performance as we know and first of all let's make them as large as possible. One tricky thing is that you do need to have um, as wide tires as possible to uh, actually get any grip whatsoever but on the other hand that means that you want to be running low rim diameters which then limit your brake size. So it is very much a compromise here as well. What you can do is pump this up and what you see here is that even though we made them super aggressive as compared to before we have hardly lost any drivability because what we lost in drivability was made up by improved braking distance which gives us back drivability. In the rear it is a different story we already have pretty good performance there but we can up the brake size anyway in order to get rid of a bit of brake fade that is definitely worth it. On the other hand we can then make it smaller just to get back a bit of drivability. If you are running into problems where you want to build a performance car and you definitely cannot afford to have such a bad braking distance of 53.6 meters in this case, well you can also put up quality quite a bit which improves braking performance all around. This also allows you to properly go down a bit more on the pad type if you so wish because this and like I said before doesn't impact brake fade just yet. Setting up the suspension properly is a whole different story and that story needs to start on the wheels tab. The first thing we need to investigate is the steering behavior graph which is also called the your rate graph. This graph tells you how much steering input translates into actual steering. In this case we can see this car is suffering from severe understeer, which is indicated by the yellow curve being significantly below the red line, which would be a one-to-one -one correspondence between steering input and steering outcome. The blue line is moderate understeer, which is much easier to drive than either a neutral car or an oversteering car. A good guideline for properly setting up your car is to place this little marker here between the blue and the red line or exactly on either of these lines for the maximum performance of either tameness for the blue line or sportiness for the red line. The first rough placement of this marker is done through tire width. If in this case for instance we have an extremely understeering car, you would want to have more tire in the front in order to offset this fact. As you can see by just upping the front tire width 
we have now created a car which in general handles much better and is very close to being the optimal tameness. The maximum value you can reach for the tameness here is a 1.05 multiplier, while the maximum sportiness value you can get here, S for sportiness, D for drivability, is a 1.0, right at the red line. Often it is the case that the closer you get towards the red line, without being oversteery at the extreme, the higher your cornering performance will be, but you will be sacrificing drivability. One thing you will definitely want to avoid is critical oversteer, which not only limits your cornering performance, but also makes the car very much undrivable. It sacrifices both sportiness and drivability. And while you might think that, oh well, an oversteery car does feel sporty, yes, but this is the uh, non-dynamic situation where you don't apply throttle. A car which is rear-wheel drive and is neutral in its setup, uh, which means following the red line, that will definitely be oversteering under throttle. If you want to increase your cornering performance in general, you can go for wider tires and a softer mixture for the tire compound. Now that you have set up your wheels, you can go back to the suspension tab and fine-tune your setup. On the first run through where you still don't have these graphs to help you, we recommend that you choose any kind of preset you are aiming for as a starting point. In this case, I just chose normal. In general, softer suspension setups mean more grip at that point. So if I decrease the spring and damper stiffness for the front, I will have more grip at the front and thus more oversteer or less understeer. Making the suspension softer also can increase ride comfort, but only up to a point. If the car is moving around like a boat, which you can see in the roll angle stat, you will actually be decreasing comfort for softer springs. Making the suspension softer also can increase ride comfort, but only up to a point. If the car is moving around like a boat, which you can see in the roll angle stat, you will actually be decreasing comfort for softer springs. The less the body reacts to the bump, the more comfortable the car will be. But on the other hand, keep in mind that if you go too soft, the roll angle will make the car feel like a boat, which isn't very comfortable. So there is a sweet spot there as well. Another limiting factor to how soft you can go with your suspension is the bottoming out stat. If that one is anything but zero, you might want to consider to up your right height. But upping right height means that you have a higher center of gravity, which negatively can affect your cornering performance. In order to counteract the boat rolling of the car, you can stiffen up the sway bars, which definitely helps in getting this figure down. It doesn't help you with bottoming out though, Sway bar stiffness and specifically camber as well as uh, to some degree spring stiffnesses can be used to fine tune steering behavior as well. Modifying the steering behavior with these settings is pretty simple on paper, but the complexities are emergent from all the different correlations between them. So the standard rule is softer means more grip. If we are in this situation, for instance, where we want to have, let's say, a more sporty car, which means that we need more grip in the front, we would go for a softer front sway bar. To make this effect even stronger, we could increase negative camber to give the front more grip during cornering. And now we have reached the point where the understeer at the critical extremes go towards extreme oversteer and that is definitely a state which we don't want so what we can do to fight this for instance would be to increase the rear end grip by increasing rear camber. Please note though that increasing camber will also increase service costs because you will be using much more tire. Choosing more advanced spring damper and sway bar setups not only gives you flat bonuses to your main car stats, but also allows you to have harder settings in the tuning, 
without having to compromise as much. It gives a softness bonus to the respective part. For instance, if I choose this one here in the springs, then I can overall make the springs much stiffer without sacrificing any comfort. And this concludes our little walk through the different graphs for braking and the suspension. I hope this helped and if not, then you already are an expert. The conclusion should be that there is no optimal setup you can choose. Uh, that very much only depends on what you are aiming for with your car. And then the best solution to becoming good at this is trying it out yourself and tinkering with it. So enjoy doing that and see you guys next time.